at the Ingham Institute and uh, Southwest Sydney LHD uh, Research Director, as well as being a professor of surgery. And I'd like to welcome everybody to this um, very special COVID-19 research showcase. Before we start, I would like us to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we stand or sit on or in. Um, they have always been, they will be, they are uh, Aboriginal lands. And I think as such, we need to respect that fact and we need to welcome um, any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Island person who may be in the audience or with us. So welcome everybody. Uh, Southwestern Sydney has been in the eye of COVID-19, the eye of the storm. And as a clinician and researcher, I can tell you that we have stared that eye down. And a lot of the staring down and dealing with COVID-19 has been due to an enormous amount of organization by the LHD and in particular by our chief executive, uh, Amanda Larkin. I think we can all be proud that we have done so well with COVID-19, and I think we can all be proud that during that period, we have not allowed our research impetus to go forward, and indeed, our research impetus continues, especially because of COVID-19. I'd like to introduce to us all uh, Amanda Larkin, who is the Chief Executive of South West Sydney NHD, and who's kindly taken a few moments off the very, very busy schedule to launch this very special uh, research uh, showcase. Amanda, over to you, and thank you for all the work you've done. Thank you, Prof, for those very kind words, and um, hello, everyone. Can I open firstly by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we meet on today, elders past, present and emerging. And as uh, Prof Bokeh said, this is and always will be Aboriginal land. I'm really um, pleased but excited to uh, do the opening for uh, the COVID-19 research um, session today and for a number of reasons. Um, and so everyone is going to have to bear with me. I think on the agenda, I've got five minutes, so I might take a little bit more if that's okay, Prof. Firstly, I would really like to welcome uh, Prof Bouquet, who has really led research through, uh, through the period of COVID, where um, we were very focused on clinical care, on caring for our community, both in patients um, and in the community. Um, and Prof has really kept our eye very focused on the importance of research, the underpinning evidence about what we're doing, and ensuring that our direction for research development in the Southwest has continued. And he's done that in conjunction with Daryl Harkness, the CEO of Ingham Institute for Applied Medical Research, who we have a deep and long partnership with. Um, and Daryl, you've also shown great leadership over that time. So it's great uh, for both of you uh, to be here today. We have a number of really wonderful speakers and why do I have why do I genuinely feel they're wonderful these are people who have absolutely been leaders around care delivery over this period of time through COVID-19 who have really stood shoulder to shoulder with all of us in relation to the work that we needed to do um, and very when I say work I'm more I really mean we've had to really rethink about care delivery. We've had to pivot quickly based on the demands and the growth in COVID that we saw the community, that we've seen in the community, and really to ensure that our people got the very best care, which they did. Um, our speakers today really reflect um, all that was done over that period of time. Um, and as I said, both in terms of inpatients um, and in the community. While also I think, um, am excited about today's session is that we really have seen um, patients at their, at their absolute sickest. We've also had to really develop new models of care, especially in the community, to manage people as they moved out of the hospital back into the community. For those who didn't need to come into hospital, we've had to 
change the way that care was delivered. So I think we're in a really wonderful position to under say, undertake some really um, deep and very meaningful research, not only in the short term, but in the longer term to see uh, the impact of the care models that we've put in place, but also not only the care models, but also to look at the impact that that's COVID had on our community. One of the really critical thing that's come out of this time of people have come to very clearly understand the absolute uh, importance of the public health unit, the critical nature of what a pandemic can do for a community that impacts not only health, but the social fabric and the economic fabric of communities. And we saw that out here in the Southwest. And really, um, I think you are in a very prime position to understand um, and to gain an understanding about uh, what that's done for the community. Uh, but then secondly, uh, what can we to go do going into the future? Because I think what we're starting to feel and what you've seen in the papers in the last couple of days about Omicron is that there will be variants, there will be changes around Delta. So as a community and as a health community, we've got to think about how do we shape services? How do we uh, develop models of care that will take us into the future and put us in the best position in order to, uh, to manage you know, other variants or other pandemics that may, uh, that may, um, may come, to our, come to our shores? So um, today I think is really exciting. One of the pivots that we had to do uh, with research and uh, Prof Bouquet led that last year was that we couldn't have our, our normal research um, for a couple of days at the uh, Inglis. Um, the, com the discussion was, can we, go, can we go virtual? I think we have, Prof, and I think it's been really embraced really well by, um, by, our, senior, by our senior people and our presenters but also people have come on board and really engaged with the virtual arrangement. And so this is what's, what we've needed. And we've been able to keep our research forums going forward, but just in a different structure. So can I just commend to you today, I think this will be a fabulous session. Uh, you have some wonderful speakers who really have a deep understanding about the impact that COVID had in the Southwest and a great opportunity kind of to learn and understand uh, what we did at the time, but also what we need to take into the future. Uh, so thank you, Prof. Thank you very, very much uh, indeed, Amanda, for taking time to address us. Um, so uh, this uh, topic, or today's topic, as, we, as you know, is all about COVID-19 research in Southwest in the LHD. Uh, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers, and I understand there's a little QA box at the bottom right hand of your screen. Correct me if I'm wrong, supporting team. And if you can write your questions, we will take them. Um, so, our first uh, speaker is uh, Associate Professor Deepak Bondiri. Uh, Deepak is an outstanding clinician, first and foremost. I don't know how many lives Deepak has saved during this period, during the COVID-19 period. But let me tell you, as someone who has worked in a Liverpool hospital and seen the work that Deepak and his colleagues do in intensive care, they have absolutely uh, done themselves. Uh, and Deepak uh, Bonajeri um, was the recipient of an OHMR round two grant of close to $500,000 and there's only 10 of these grants awarded, and two of these were awarded to our researchers in southwestern Sydney, one of whom is uh, Professor Bonagiri, and on a topic that I'm particularly interested in, and that is virtual care. So over to you, and thank you again, Deepak. No, thank you, uh, Les, and thank you for inviting me. And it's an indeed a pleasure to be here. Thanks for your kind words uh, at the beginning of, of this. So we'll bring the one slide that, um, that I have up soon. I'm just going to talk about the 24-7 EICU project that we did. And this project, uh, while the slide's coming up, just for those who uh, are online, was a, a follow-up of the work that we were already doing during COVID. So we implemented a virtual day um, round between Campbelltown ICU and Goulburn and uh, Bowral ICUs. So what we essentially did was those ICUs 
Uh, we used to see their patients every day. We used to make plans for these. At that stage, those ICUs did not have specialist intensivists, and there were physicians and anesthetists who were looking after patients there. So we provided the specialist level of care. And as an extension of that, we, we decided to see or to study whether close collaborative ICUs or enhanced open collaborative ICUs, which was our model of care, whether there was any difference in terms of the safety and quality of care provided. And we also wanted to look at the patient experience, the clinician experience, as well as the executive who run the hospital, their experiences. So we got this grant funding, as they said, and we commenced the project in September. Uh, if you, you, you can believe during September, we were in the peak of COVID in our district, but we were lucky enough to, um, to, to recruit nurses to run this. And we started our EICU nursing, monitoring of patients in the study ICUs in September. We've been going for two months now. Um, we, we run the, the control center is actually in Cambridge and the study centers are Barrel and Urban. And now we've got Vega on board too. So we've got the third ICU that we're monitoring. So far, we found that the escalation works really well. We set up some of the projects and the early lessons that we learned are improving the charting in PowerChart that we're seeing. So we're using the existing uh, BTF and IVU uh, that exists within PowerChart to monitor patients as well as doing telehealth. So using video technology to see patients as well as doing rounds on telehealth. Um, we got an increased supervision by level ICU team leaders. So the team leaders and our EIC nurses are constantly in contact. Medical staff are engaged and we've created an escalation flow chart so that we know when to step in and, and look after these projects. So far, we I think we've done phenomenally well in the middle of uh, COVID and that was the point of this project was to support these ICUs uh, during COVID. Luckily, none of our study ICUs have had any COVID patients that require transfer out to them or any sick COVID patients, but we managed a few COVID patients in both an ICU uh, with our collaborative model of care. Well, where I see this going is that we'll be extending this project and we put in another grant to look at an enhanced model through the translational uh, research grant scheme. And I want to continue this work for another year to get, get a more robust um, uh, uh, data set, which we can interrogate and to provide a more robust report. The other thing, of course, which I'd be remiss if I didn't say is that uh, when we do these studies, there's always the equipoise element, which is to say that this um, uh, intervention may not be taken as kindly. And we're looking especially at the clinician and why, uh, clinician surveys, and we want to look at it to see whether clinicians still support uh, this model of care. So it'll be interesting to see this project, and I look forward to any questions that people have after when we have the question time at the end of uh, the meeting. So I might stop here, and Susan, we're not taking questions now, are we? No, i uh, Questions at the end? Uh, thank you very much indeed, Deepak. Thank you very much for an inspiring talk and congratulations again on your research award. Our next speaker is uh, Professor uh, Josephine Chow. Um, Josephine Chow is legendary. She is an outstanding nurse. She has contributed so much to Southwestern Sydney. But more importantly and broadly, she is a very seasoned researcher, and in particular in renal medicine. And uh, she's recently, I've got the pleasure to let you know that she's been appointed as Professor of Nursing and Midwifery Alliance in South Sydney LHD. And she is helping me significantly with the uh, research directorship in Southwest South Sydney. She um, also had a prominent role in uh, managing our COVID-19 centre, and she'll be able to talk to us a wee bit more about her monitoring of COVID-19 patients. Thank you and welcome, Professor Chow. Thank you, Deepak. 
Okay, thank you, Professor Bouquet. Um, I think this slide can tell you how exciting with the health technology. Uh, and as you all know that uh, most of the cases, COVID cases, they are managed in the community, thank goodness. And in 2020, in July, we have opportunity to conduct a study uh, called the BIT. It's a biofirmous Everon armband tele-monitoring, uh, called the BIT pilot study. We haven't got a big number at the time, so this is a feasibility study looking at one of the TGA approved devices, first of its kind in the country and in the southern hemisphere at the time. So we managed to put 19 patients, we put 19 patients and assess the feasibility and suitability of the device for remote monitoring. And the, the outcome was really promising in a way that the smart device has provided accurate vital science data and then also escalation. I was as a principal investigator on the weekend. I can see the escalation indicating that the patients, one of the patients actually getting into trouble. And then we actually contact triple I hub at the time and escalate and transfer the patient to the hospital. Um, the user, the patient in particular, uh, indicating the device is user friendly. This is really important because the patient set up. So with that, um, with that uh, experience back in that time with the bit, with the pilot study, detecting the temperature, the oxygen saturation, the heart rate for the patient in the home isolation. In 2021, you can see the lumbar. This is not the latest lumbar. The latest lumbar today is we hit 24,000 confirmed cases of Delta wave for, from June. And then what happened? All right, we set up something called the Oxy disk which is a centralized distribution and sourcing uh, center within the LHD. You can see the photo there with all the deliverable and the pulse oximeters. So we deliver every single pulse oximeter in the region. And then also pretty much, I think the comment from me is that we actually pretty much get every single pulse oximeter from the country. So we deliver, distribute over 7,000 plus pulse oximeters to the communities since July. And with that, because of the lumbar is so high, and our colleague in the primary community health, they yeah, can't actually really manage the big volume of human call to follow patient. We did the four days with our AI uh, company uh, startup. We actually pop up a uh, curious thing with the design and with the pilot and text, everything we did the four days. And then we can, you can actually look at it. This is a care robot making contact to patient by phone call to the mobile, recording the physical condition, the wellness check and support. We, since mid-September, we got over 6,000 uh, clients and then 39,000 calls are from Sam the AI, which we call the care robot. And then you can see the feedback on there from the staff and the patient is extremely positive. So we're doing a protocol research, proper evaluation on those technology. Yes, so the circle in the middle is the final message to take home. So we have to work with, not just internal uh, care provider, we need to work with the industry, with the tech, uh, med tech, and then also with our con consumer to actually make sure it's a patient center care delivery really matter to our patients. Thank you. So thank you very much, um, Josephine. And as we heard from the last two speakers, there's been a significant emphasis on remote sensing. And I can understand how the first two speakers are very much part of the Ingham Institute uh, Robotics and Health Technology Center. I'd like to introduce uh, now Ms. Uh, Megan Ford. Now, Megan Ford, um, we were lucky enough to recruit from industry to be our executive director of clinical trials. Underpinning all of our work in South of Sydney LHD at the Ingham Institute is science. And the basis of most medical science is in fact clinical trials. And Megan Ford brings 20 to 25 years of huge experience, I might add, and good humor to uh, to our clinical trials program. So welcome Meg and thank, thank you for the work that you've done. Thanks Les. Um, 
Well, it was a very interesting time to join a site, um, <laughs> I have to say, when COVID hit. Uh, but we've been able to implement many, many COVID-19 clinical trials um, over the last two years. And really, uh, we, we, we have a, cl a clinical trial support unit that is across Southwestern Sydney Local Health District and the EU Institute. And the idea for that, uh, this unit is to be able to support um, any clinical trials that are occurring um, across uh, the Southwestern Sydney community. I have a very lovely team um, of Kelsey Dover Brown, uh, Shashi uh, Prasad, and Ria, who really do support all of the clinical trial activities. And when COVID hit, we were really inundated with um, a lot of clinical trials. So what we needed to do was actually take stock and look at what we should actually be taking on board. And we came up with the strategy, uh, we developed a steering committee for COVID-19 clinical trials, and we came up with a strategy uh, that we then fulfilled and looked at the, those clinical trials. That included um, how we treated people in the community, hospitalised patients and anybody who was in intensive care. As you can imagine, when COVID first hit, there were a lot of treatments, uh, options being thrown around, and it only became apparent once good clinical trials were conducted of what was going to be effective and what was not going to be effective. So having the ability to choose those clinical trials so we cover the gamut of um, the community was really, really important. The other thing um, that we looked at very carefully was what was our mix of industry-sponsored clinical trials, which meant that they're, they're drug trials that come uh, from the pharmaceutical, biotech and device industry versus collaborative group, group trials, which are the academic clinical trials that allow us to actually study a question um, that is really based on um, a scientific question that researchers have and doctors have, and then investigator-initiated trials. So those trials are the ones that are initiated within um, southwestern Sydney, within the doctors, the nurses, the allied health staff, to be able to support what is actually happening in our community. So we had a really nice mix of, of trials. You will have heard from Deepak and Josephine around what they did as part of the clinical trial activities, and we really supported those um, activities. We had device clinical trials, we had drug clinical trials, and we also had um, clinical trials um, that were collecting data. So we participated and we, unfortunately, I always said this, I was very happy when we didn't recruit to these clinical trials, but we ended up recruiting large numbers into several of those clinical trials as a result of, of the numbers of COVID uh, positive patients in the community. One of the wonderful things I think that we did um, is put in technology that supports clinical trials and doing clinical trials in a time where people could come into hospital. And then we also um, had the support of the research directorate within Southwestern Sydney. So I have to say a very big thank you to everybody who worked on that team. We centralised all of those processes. We actually ensured that we had um, a very quick start-up of activities. We, ran, we had seven ad hoc uh, ethics committee meetings, which is phenomenal. Um, from the Ethics Committee. So a very big thank you to the Ethics Committee and the uh, Research Governance Office as well. Um, and that's what we got up to over the last two years, less with clinical trials. Well, thank you very much indeed, Megan. I'm glad that that's all you got up to the last couple of years. <laughs> we weren't going to ask you any further questions. Uh, um, our next topic is Allied Health, and I have the pleasure of introducing not one Allied Health leader, but two Allied Health leaders. What does that make? Two Allied Health? Is there a gaggle of Allied Health? Or I was going to say triumvirate. Uh, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll be the third person. So, um, Allied Health played a, a prominent role in our research and clinical work in, during the COVID 19 period, which I suspect is going to be ongoing. 
especially if we go into the long COVID-19 research that we're interested in. Uh, so I can introduce uh, Elise Baker, who is Associate Professor of Allied Health at uh, Western Sydney University, and your main interest is in speech pathology. And um, Sarah Dennis, who is Professor of Allied Health at the University of Sydney, who works at the Ingham Institute. And can I just say that um, both of you have done a fantastic job in promoting academic uh, research uh, in, um, in allied health. You've really given us in Southwestern Sydney a very prominent academic protocol. So thank you to both of you. Are you going to speak conjointly or in, in, in one voice? Or what do you do? <laughs> well, would you like both to come here and conjoin? Okay. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> so, um, as Liz has in, uh, indicated, um, Sarah and I work together looking at the search on the impact um, of COVID on allied health services. So, if you can take a look at this slide and imagine what allied health services were like before COVID. As you can see, allied health serve thousands of people across our district in a variety of contexts from one-to-one -one services face-to-face -face, through to group, group settings. Um, helping preemie babies uh, with feeding through to people at the end stage of life and everything in between. Next slide, please. Uh, when COVID hit, these services were turned and flipped upside down. This created a unique opportunity to reimagine and rethink what allied health services might look like. Uh, as you can see there on the slide, many of these services um, needed to quickly transform and use telehealth. Other services actually were stopped for a period of time while allied health nations supported the response to COVID. Next slide, please. In response to that unique opportunity where um, there were new ways of trying to provide allied health services, this prevented, presented uh, a unique opportunity to conduct some research on what appeared to be kind of an un, a naturally unhealthy uh, situation. And so we created two projects. The first one is looking at a cross-sectional survey focus specifically on our clinicians and what their experience was of having, having to rapidly take up telehealth. Uh, our primary aim was looking at just what percentage of our clinicians in allied health use telehealth, was their readiness to use, uh, use telehealth, and then also we're interested in looking at were there any differences across allied health disciplines, physiotherapy, speech pathology, dietetics, occupation therapy, psychology, and so on, uh, as well as across different client groups. Uh, a third aim we were looking at was what were the clinicians perceived equivalents of telehealth to face-to-face -face services? And then fourthly, do we see any uh, influence around clinicians' prior readiness uh, and use of telehealth and technology more broadly in decisions in ongoing use of telehealth? Uh, and then finally, exploring what are potential barriers and facilitators to successful use of telehealth. On our next slide, um, just at one of the, the brief findings we've got so far, which is not unexpected, is that allied health professionals who identified their day-to-day -day work before COVID-19 as talking and communication-based assessment and therapy were significantly more likely to be using video for telehealth. But the story isn't that simple. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, you can see we're, we're really interested in thinking about what are going to be the outcomes, for example, for our patients requiring rehabilitation. Um, how did multidisciplinary teams cope when they couldn't assess young children together in the same room? What was the impact on that? And then our next final point there, what happened to group programs like Auntie Mama's Falls program? Uh, that leads me over to Sarah to talk about our second study. Thank you, Elise. So our second study was looking at the impact of um, the changes in COVID and the rapid transition to allied health on patient, mainly patient outcomes. We looked at, um, we had surveys again, looking at um, what changes were made and how they impacted on the service and the patients. And then in the second part of that study, we're running a series of service specific case studies where we're actually trying to measure some of the clinical outcomes and patient experience of um, the transition to telehealth. Final slide, please. Thank you. So with this project, the analysis is still underway. We're hoping to collect some more data from the recent wave of COVID. And what we're hoping is that this data will inform the way that Allied Health use telehealth after COVID and moving forward so that we use it in the most effective way 
um, possible. Thank you. So thank you very much indeed. There will be, be time for questions and answers at the end of the symposium, but um, so thank you both very, very much indeed. Um, it's quite obvious that um, during the COVID period, um, the, the district and Ingham did not only have to, to um, take responsibility for the emergency of COVID and to answer to that emergency, but it's, 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 um, it's quite um, surprising that we have time to actually look at the long-term consequences of COVID. And that surprises, I think, the reality of what COVID research is going to be all about, the long-term consequences of this very difficult period that we have gone through and will probably continue to go through. Our next speaker is a dynamo in research, as Professor Bowser Eben. Bowser uh, is Professor and Chair of Infant and Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the University of New South Wales. She's Head of the Academic Unit of Child Psychiatry, Southwood Sydney LHD and the Ingham Institute. She has participated very, uh, very effectively in our SPHERE uh, partnership. And she was one of the two OHMR uh, grant recipients last year, two out of 10 uh, that came out of Southwestern Sydney LHD. So, Parasa, thank you for all your work that you've done, your research, your enthusiasm, and the fact that no matter how difficult things are, you've always got a positive answer. So, you're ever so welcome. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a novel innovative platform that we had to come up with to cope with some of the things that were troubling us, which is children who normally would go to a GP or a child family health nurse to get the well baby checks done, could no longer do that. And the kids, as you would imagine, once who were born in late 2019 are now two years of age. So that's a long time to be not having those routine checks done. I might need the slide check here. You can just check everything here. Yeah. So what's the challenge? Clinics are closed. And that has widened the inequity in service access because multiple cultural families were already not engaging for those well baby health visits. So now with the pandemic, children with speech delay or autism are going to be ever more going to be delayed in getting that diagnosis. And we also heard about a shadow pandemic, which is to do with the mental health consequences that these families are struggling with. So that's one more thing that I have to worry about. And wait for this one. There was a national survey um, of the impact of COVID-19. And of the 10 communities across Australia that's most impacted for children living in family employment stress, three are in South Pacific. Fairfield was second, and you also had pounds down Kamata. That's three out of 10 across the country. So Watch Me Grow is planning to change a little bit of that trajectory for families who are not engaging by going to their homes and to their communities, taking this digital platform of well baby check items to their homes, or if they engage with multicultural playgroups, wherever they go, we go with them. And we are um, focusing on three things. One is child development. But for the pandemic edition in the Watch Me Grow web link, we also added speakily a family mental health question <laughs> and also family social needs, how they are going for food on the table, finances, housing, etc. We've got two sites, Fairfield for the multicultural families and Marmiji for the regional rural. And when concerns are identified using this web link, then a na navigator, a service navigator will get involved and connect them with the relevant family for services. So next please. And these are some of the um, feedback, qualitative feedback. Very happy to be part of the program. Um, it's great that we can go back to you for help. Thank you so much and very appreciative of the service information you gave. So these are some of the qualitative uh, feedback that will lead there. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, as you can see, uh, the Ingham Institute in Southwest Sydney have got a significant electronic platform 
to to add to our center for for robotics and health uh, technology. And I, and I like your watch me grow uh, comment. I wish I could grow. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's going to happen there, I'm afraid. But thank you again, Darcy. It'll be time to ask you questions uh, at the end of the symposium. Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Zinta Harrington. Uh, Zinta is a respiratory and sleep physician and uh, head of uh, that unit at Liverpool Hospital. Uh, Zinta and her colleagues were at the forefront of, uh, of, of our work uh, at managing COVID-19 during the busiest possible times. And uh, Zinta, you and your colleagues, we ought to be congratulated and thanked for keeping us safe, not us as a community, but also us as nurses and doctors and taking all the phone calls that we had and our, our concerns. So thank you for all the work that you've done and, and thank you for presenting. Thank you. I'm Cynthia Harris. I'm Head of Respiratory and Sleep Medicine at Liverpool, as Liz, thank you, uh, explained. And I'm also a proud member of the COVID Clinical Task Force, and it's about the clinical service delivery challenges that we encounter that I'm going to speak today in order to show you some of the opportunities that might be useful for exploring research questions. Thank you. So what did we experience? In the last six months at Liverpool, we experienced what we weren't expecting after having come through 2020 fairly lightly. In the last six months, we experienced over 22,000 COVID cases in Sydney Southwest, um, and a large number of those were managed at Liverpool Hospital, although we still had to get assistance from Campbelltown Hospital and send patients out of district when we simply weren't able to meet the clinical demands. Thank you. What did we learn through that process? I had some major learnings. I learned the importance of teamwork across disciplines and different craft groups. And that was what comes together in a crisis. And we were very lucky with a team that was very functional. There was new knowledge to be gained, uh, not only just about a virus and a new illness, but about parts of the hospital that we didn't know existed and processes that were new. I learned how to scale up. A year ago, I asked myself, how do you prepare a hospital for a disease that goes from 10 patients to 1,000 patients in a short time? I've learned how to do that now. I learned how important it was to stick to the science, find out what is actually known about a disease, even when there isn't very much, because that were the crucial parts you had to anchor your plan on is what was, what was true. We had to pay attention to detail in the critical areas that would make a difference. And for us, they were the front door of the hospital, particularly the emergency department and the maternity unit. But there were also some surprise critical areas, which includes aged care and the mental health units, where you have um, areas where you can be particularly vulnerable to an um, infection outbreak. We learned how to implement change very rapidly, and this doesn't suit everybody. So we had to do it in a way that ensued uh, confidence and um, that the message got across and there were very many messages being delivered. So trying to find ways of making messages congruent and sensible and not invoking panic. And that was through communication and communication was critical at so many levels. The communication with the patient at the bedside, the families, because that communication link was broken by COVID communication across teams and across the facility and the district and then outwards to the community via the media or through various social media platforms. So how we communicated was a major learning. And we learned that kindness was powerful and we needed to put the hospital into context within the healthcare system. Thank you. So. There are learnings from the past. I just want to mention one moment about the future, and that is the unknown. We are now dealing, as we expected, with a new variant. We are dealing with a compassion fatigue. We are dealing with uh, workforce changes. That is all the future. 
Thank you. Thank you, Zinto. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so, once in a while, you, you consider yourself very lucky. Um, and you consider yourself lucky when you, when you meet someone who has been described as outstanding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is our next speaker, Mark Parsons, a professor of medicine with, um, with a very keen interest in stroke medicine. Mark is not just an outstanding clinician and researcher, he really is a good friend of South Virginia HD and a very, very good friend of the Ingham Institute. And he's only been with us for a few short months, but he's already melted into our DNA and is contributing so much to our, to our, to our thinking and our research. And I've said enough nice things about him for the last <laughs> a year. So you better say we've got to have a a good presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. Uh, hi, everybody online. Yes, the rolling stones. Can everybody online see that? Yes. <laughs> I've never seen the rolling stones live. That's one of my ambitions, but I'm not sure if I'll, they'll live long enough for, for them to come back to Australia. Do you think they will? Anyway, as I said, I'm actually a neurologist um, and I moved to southwestern Sydney from Melbourne, originally grew up in the Hunter 18 months ago, and it's been really wonderful uh, working here uh, in a much nicer environment to work in than many others that I've worked in without saying anything negative about other places. Um, and um, in, in my time here, I've, I've come across a lot of um, very uh, cool, uh, very cool research, some great clinicians and some great clinician researchers. And um, I feel like a bit of an imposter because I'm not really a COVID expert, although I've seen the fair share of patients with COVID neurological problems here at Liverpool. Um, but I'm particularly interested in uh, long COVID and the follow-up of um, that condition. So um, I might just show you some slides, which I borrowed. They're not my slides, Ellie, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, they'll be, keep going. That's it, yes, thank you. So this is really, this is really Paul Middleton's work. So I have to acknowledge Paul for this. So, so um, my task was to talk about um, how can we uh, measure the long-term effects of COVID, both in an individual but also on a population level. And um, the way I think that we we can and will do this is is on the back of of Paul's um, data warehouse developed originally from ED data called Cedric comprehensive emergency data set for something, something, something. And um, and uh, in that data set, there are 2 million ED presentations from our five Southwestern Sydney uh, LHD EDs. But, all, but uh, lately relevant to COVID, there are 80,000 uh, COVID patients in that registry. Now, this provides, I think, a unique um, opportunity for us in the Southwest to um, follow up these people long term, and we can look at all sorts of different factors. You can go to the next slide, please, Ellie. Yes, and um, so we're, we're uh, Paul and team, but many collaborators, including me and the last speaker, Zinta, um, uh, lots of our health people, rehab physicians, public health people, epidemiologists, um, data scientists. So some of the cool things that we're looking at doing is. Is, is looking at uh, long-term um, physiologic monitoring. So, so we, we, we now know that maybe 10 to 20% of people who have a, uh, a COVID infection have long-term symptoms beyond six months. And that commonly affects cardiac, respiratory and the brain, funnily enough, which is why I'm obviously interested in the area. I've only got one minute from here that I've talked for too long. But there are all sorts of things that we can look at, but we're particularly interested in using um, uh, uh, Cedric, which has evolved into CAKE, um, and the next page will tell you what that acronym stands for, I think. <laughs> um, so this is really the, the COVID um, platform, and we will be doing um, long-term SMS follow-up of these, these people to get um, our PROMS, patient reported outcome measures, we'll also be looking at physiologic measures, we'll be looking at effects on the population, geographic modelling, economic evaluation, um, and this is obviously relevant to many other conditions, including stroke for that matter. So um, thanks very much. And thanks to Paul for the slides. So thank you very much indeed, 
Um, Mark, we're going to, we've got a few more minutes left for questions and answers, and I think someone heard all of our speakers. Um, so, yeah, if we can get all of our speakers, by um, and that's an army of speakers. Uh, I feel <laughs> You're going to stand behind me. I've got to watch my back. Um, so, um, thank you all very much. Me. Can I start off by maybe Zinta or uh, Deepak? At the moment, uh, our newspapers are full of, are full of uh, the next variant. Is it Micron or D Micron or something like that? Omicron. Omicron. <laughs> Sounds very Greek to me, you know, sort of, sort of thing that. Develops in Marrickville. So, um, Zinta, <laughs> should we be worried? Do you, have you, do you have any knowledge that I don't have apart from I've got the name wrong? I have what I've read and heard, which is that we should be careful. I'm never worried anymore because I'm worried a lot last year and it wasn't all necessary. But I certainly think we need to take it seriously. So uh, let's prepare. We've had a trial run now. So yeah. we've um, had our chance to practice our, our skills and scale up. But I certainly wouldn't uh, take it for granted that we're going to fly through this. And, and that spiky little weasel that we see in the newspapers on the new Omicron. Yes. Tell us a little bit more about it. Is it just, um, is it just a growth? <laughs> And, uh, I think it's the deletion of one of the uh, genes from the uh, uh, where they see it, and that's why they wanted that the vaccine may not work against it. Right. But there, there's some people who say that Omicron, although it's more contagious, it, yeah. uh, it might not cause as much disease. So if, if it becomes a prevalent variant, then it might actually be better because we want, because Delta, as you know, the wave that we had. It was um, really virulent and people were getting very sick with it. So hopefully with Omicron, people don't get sick. So if they yeah. just get a, get a few, get the sniffles and get better, that's what they think. And that's what we hope. And hopefully our high vaccination rate really helps us. So Josephine, thank you very much. You know, um, if, if, and God forbid, heaven forbid that we have to do that, if we have to suddenly flex up, um, because of this variant, how quickly could we do that with our experience in South Western Sydney? Yeah, so that for the device for parts of Sydney, we're going to cost it down to the one stock. Yeah, so we can actually still source in the equipment and then anything like PPE and all that all be looked after by Brian Lane. So it's totally set up, it's a shipping container, storing all that. And equipment definitely uh, we've got so you've got a model that can be quickly put in place yes. quite quickly we're talking 24 hours a week oh. how long is it yes the, the year off with uh, leadership with Sonia and Brian we, yeah. we pop up the lockdown apartment lockdown really quickly we set up the yeah. hotel with Western City really quickly so we just we will do that and we know exactly where to start around for the deployment so Sarah and uh, and Elise um one of the things that we know is that our staff has had to be redeployed. And I can tell you from a surgical point of view, many of our nursing staff had to be redeployed from surgery to intensive care. A lot of them are absolutely exhausted at the end of it. There's, there's a burnout. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit more about that burnout? And how quickly can we burn them back in again? Because if we didn't have that staff, we we can't we can't go forward if the, the, the little micron fellow strikes yeah, again. And I think the challenge for allied health is going to be that burnout's going to have a longer tail yep. because services were cancelled or postponed, so wait lists have grown. So I think the challenge for allied health is going to be how we manage that moving forwards and how we think about redesigning our services to sure. catch up with ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. I, I guess you also think that um, the clinicians are needing to feel like they're continually reimagining what to do. They'll, they'll come up with one plan and then things change and then they need to recontact their, their clients and families and reimagine. So I think just that continual reimagining and re-figuring out what the plan is going to be is exhausting. Yeah. I think there's certainly an awareness of that. 
um, quite a number of the teams are pulling together now to just do some of that kind of debriefing, regrouping, and looking at moving plans, plans moving forward. So that's part of what we're doing in the research, having focus groups with our clinicians to better understand that. I, um, I think partnering with universities as well in terms of how students might be able to support, you know, help out with some of that process moving forwards too. Thank you. So, Valerie, if I could ask you a question uh, on, on a daily basis in the newspapers, you read about, you know, how troublesome it is for someone living in the eastern suburbs being locked up for you know, a number of days. Uh, translate that to, to our world. Southwestern Sydney, we're not on the beach, it's hot, and um, our demographics are different, thankfully different, because we have such a wonderful variety. But how does this translate to, to our children in, in southwestern Sydney? And as I said before, I mean, as a community, um, we are much worse affected in terms of the mental health and the social pandemic on the tail of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. And I said in my presentation that of the 10 communities across Australia that's most impacted with children living in employment stress families, three of us are those fit in the ten. Is that true? Right? Across exactly. Australia. So, yeah. uh, so we are kind of starting from a place where things were all really bad and think this is kind of widened that inequity. But the good side of it is that you know we thought we were clever when we went to the waiting room of GP practices that said catch every kid who was getting the 18 month vaccination by piggybacking on the vaccination list since we will get run much extra. And then you've got the vaccinations in the car parks and nobody's coming anywhere near the waiting room. So we have had that opportunity to then say that shouldn't stop us from reaching out to these families. And the project is all about going to their homes where our children go, but they go to multicultural playrooms, we go there, they go, they go nowhere, they go to their homes. So we put in some service efficiency by default there. Because before we would go in various places that were being interacted. Now we've got a system we wanted to, yeah. we can reach everybody by getting the link to their homes. And so I think there is also a positive side to the South West Sydney um, workforce because child and family health nurses through this web link will get the ones that really need your attention. So there's an opportunity for service efficiency there as well. And kind of why kind of bring that widening equity, equity gap. Yeah. So in many ways, South West Sydney can celebrate its 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 leadership um, and can celebrate its population with the help of health technology, which you mm -hmm. and so many others in this group have brought. Yes, I think um, we, we we've got a lot to celebrate for, but in terms of you know, the essence of our children in South West Sydney and our families. Uh, I think your word centre, you know, we, we, we've learned how to be kind. <laughs> During a pandemic, I think we probably have underestimated the, the, uh, the, um, the importance of being gentle and kind towards each other in our community. Uh, yeah. So if I can turn to you, Professor Parsons, seeing that I was so kind to you uh, in my introduction. Uh, so uh, we, we go beyond uh, COVID. Let's say that this Omicron thing is just a little affair that's going to pass by. <clears throat> Surely uh, what we've been through, both health-wise, mental-wise, social-wise, economic-wise, will have significant consequences. So where is that idea that you and I have discussed about to look at the long-term consequences um, of, of COVID-19? Well, I think it all gets back to data and I'm very passionate about data like a lot of us are. So uh, we, every cloud has a silver lining, I say, and, and the fact we've had so many people with COVID in southwestern and western Sydney means we've got a unique opportunity to to follow um, people long term, but also the effects on individual communities, um, the, the health economic effects, the um, long term mental health effects, kids and adults. So I think we've really got a great opportunity with that with that 
data and, and, and I was talking to Deepak outside, I really think that that's where we should be going with our academic um, health service partnerships as well, including SPEAR, is we really should be focusing on new models of care that have been forced onto us by COVID and, and, and assessing them and assessing whether they're cost effective. So I think once in a while we, we're all faced with the Kodak moment. The Kodak moment is when the Kodak people thought that digital um, technology was a load of digital nonsense. And of course, they, they went bankrupt within six months. And those of us who don't really uh, look at um, automation and health technology will be left behind. And that's what most of you have presented here today. But Meg Ford, you come to us with significant experience in the, in the, in, in, in the private sphere. Um, and could you just give us an idea of how we can make use of, of our unique position in southwestern Sydney to be part of clinical trials, not necessarily in Australia, but worldwide? Sure, Les. I think one of the things that southwestern Sydney has that a lot of other places around Australia don't have is that really diverse population. And that gives us a huge advantage in terms of clinical trials because we can represent many different countries within our um, LHD. And so that gives us something that is not present in many other places in Australia. So it makes us very attractive as a place to come and do research. But we've also got to look on the flip side of that and really look at how do we engage the community um, so that we can bring them into that research so that it's actually good for them and good for the community. And th so that's something we're working really hard to do is look at how do we bring technology that allows us different languages, that whatever language somebody um, speaks at home, that's a language that we can actually um, be using when we're talking to them and when they're actually on a clinical trial. So it's really, really important that we invest in that technology. Well, thank you very much. I've been warned that I've only got <laughs> one minute left. And on that note of being attractive, I think we all are very attractive. <laughs> can, we, uh, can I thank uh, all of our speakers, our researchers? Keep in mind that each of our speakers here represents a group of people within South West Sydney. And each of them have, have reached out well beyond South West Sydney for their research. Uh, work and their and their and their thinking. So let's not think that South of Sydney is isolated. We've got a huge opportunity to use all of our, uh, as they say in French, our uh, two our our assets to to reach to Western Sydney, Nepean, um, Central Sydney, Bondi Beach, and so on, which would be which would be very nice. So thank you all, and thank our audience, and uh, thank our support staff for keeping us in time and um yes thank you thank you very much